My name is Nate Angel. I'm the Director of Marketing at Hypothesis. I'm joined here by my colleague, Heather Staines. Hi. And she'll, she'll uh, introduce herself in just a second. I just wanted to um, uh, give you guys a couple of pointers on housekeeping. We're using this uh, Zoom platform to give this webinar. Uh, and it has two features that allow you to communicate with us. Um, one of them is the chat feature, which you can see probably in a toolbar at the bottom of your screen where it says chat. Heather's already been uh, doing a little bit of chat inside the window there, uh, as have some others. We'll be posting some links uh, that we talk about from the webinar into that chat. There's also a Q&A button at the bottom that you can use uh, as you move along, uh, as we move along through the webinar, you can um, uh, enter any questions and answers that you would like to see us address. Uh, we should have plenty of time uh, to just talk amongst ourselves um, after we do a short presentation at the beginning. So there will be plenty of time for that. We are recording this and we will post it um, and send you a link to it, um, to both the slides and the recording after the, after the show. Uh, it takes about a couple of hours to get that all put together. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and um, start sharing my screen again. Show the beautiful mountains that Apple's provided for us. There. And we will get started. Uh, Heather, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Heather Staines, the Director of Partnerships for Hypothesis. I'm happy to have so many of you join us uh, for today. Um, thanks uh, for, for kicking us off, Nate. Uh, first, I want to give you a little overview um, of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, Nate, do you want to advance the slides? Great. Um, first, we're going to give you a little intro of um, about hypothesis and, and how it works. Um, then we'll go into a little bit more detail from an implementation standpoint on how you can integrate hypothesis um, on your site yourself. Um, then for, for those of you who may not have a big technical team or may not have the time, uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, and talk about how we can work with you um, to do a supported implementation. And then as Nate said, we should have plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end. So I'm gonna hand over to Nate uh, to give the, the first bit um, and I'll talk to you in just a bit. Thanks, Heather. So um, one of the things that's a little bit different about Hypothesis is uh, how we are as an organization. Um, we're, a, we're a nonprofit organization and we formed on that, uh, formed that way on purpose so that we could be uh, an independent entity um, that was really dedicated to the mission of moving annotation forward uh, across uh, all the different domains, including especially the domain of, of publishing and scholarly uh, publishing. We've been uh, funded to date by uh, grants from generous sponsors like you see on, on the slide. Uh, and also key to this, um, this stature that we have, the status that we have as a nonprofit organization is that we um, work in an open source model so that every, all the technology that we write, we publish openly um, uh, in a repository. And for anyone who leans in a more technical direction, I invite you to visit the developers page, which we will share the link um, in the chat later uh, on our website, which contains all the information that you would want to uh, learn about in order to get in, more heavily involved with the open technology itself. Uh, another key aspect to um, that open strategy is uh, the degree to which we are uh, integrated with the new W3C web standard for annotation that was published in uh, just about a year ago. Now coming up, we're coming up on the one year anniversary. We should have a birthday party for the web standard. Um, and uh, we, Hypothesis was one of the participants in helping to make this web standard happen and uh, we're um, very committed to uh, uh, maintaining uh, close alignment with the standard ourselves so that we can all live in a world where any annotation solution that you choose um, conforms to the standard and uh, then annotations can be fully interoperable across the whole corpus of, of human knowledge, hopefully, at least that's the goal, and so that people don't get stuck in proprietary silos um, where information is, is kind of hidden away. Um, just a little bit more on, on hypothesis and, and where we are these days. Uh, so. Um, you know, compiling numbers through November last year, 
Um, we're up to just about 2.4 million annotations. We may hit 2.5 today. I know Heather's anxiously watching, watching the numbers tick by. Um, so that, that could happen any minute now. Um, and you can see from this chart that um, there's a kind of a range of different modes now that, uh, that people are annotating in both public and private. And so the blue in the bottom are people that are just taking notes for themselves in a private mode. The green is uh, in the public where they're, they're annotating fully publicly. And then um, the capability that we have out in the wild right now is the idea of using private groups where groups of people will come together and collaborate. We'll talk about that more. And so you see people who are both sharing with their private group, the other people in their group and or privately inside those groups as well. And so you can see uh, the kind of uh, how uh, annotation use uh, with hypothesis, hypothesis has sort of increased over time, um, showing a, a healthy growth rate. And we also are starting to see annotation now um, around the world. Uh, it's heavily centered in English speaking countries on the, in the upper left, as you can see here, uh, including the United States and the UK. Um, but we're, we see um, this, you know, a pretty concentrated uh, activity in smaller pieces now in countries all over the world. And so this is the same time frame as that last graph and it gives you the the top, uh, the top 30 countries that have, uh, where there have been annotation sessions, um, making those annotations that we saw in the graph before. Uh, so we wanna talk now just a little bit uh, to give you an overview of how hypothesis works. Um, and so trying to understand uh, the sort of the basic functionality so that um, you walk into the idea of um, how to implement the tool um, with an understanding of, of the capabilities. And so one of the first uh, uh, things to understand about the way hypothesis is, is architected is the idea that it is uh, offering multiple layers of annotation. And so going back to when I was talking about the idea of there being a public layer and then private groups on top of that, that's this idea of layers of annotation, right? And so you can kind of imagine it as um, almost putting a transparency over some sort of web document, right? Whether uh, that's a, a web page or a PDF or an EPUB. And that first layer of transparency might be the, the public groups layer. However, if you'd like to switch to a view of seeing only a private group, um, you can, uh, use hypothesis to switch that view and bring up a layer that just shows the annotations in your group of collaborators that you've organized yourselves. We're rolling out a couple of other kinds of um, group configurations now that um, Heather will be talking to you about in a minute. Um, the, this idea of layers enables hyp hypothesis to um, bring some kind of order to the uh, different uh, modes in which one might wanna annotate and so that uh, publishers uh, can have more control over uh, the kinds of layers that they want to expose on their their sites. And so they might have um, both that public layer and then uh, there might be private uh, groups um, annotating in their own layers on top of that information. And then the publisher might also be exposing other public layers that contain um, notes or authorial interventions and so forth. The basic underlying architecture of hypothesis is based on a kind of classic client service server model where the, the client is the tool that you use or people use to annotate. And so it's based in the browser and um, uh, it's the tool that allows you to highlight text once you have it open in the browser uh, and then annotate on it, add tags, save it, you know, log in, log out, reply, um, share, all the kinds of things that you would do as a human being interacting with the actual annotations. When you make an annotation, however, those are saved in the server, uh, in a server environment. And another uh, key part of Hypothesis open standards based interoperable philosophy is the idea that there won't necessarily only be one server that might be holding the annotations of the world. So Hypothesis maintains and runs like kind of uh, the default reference server infrastructure for hypothesis annotation. Um, but there are other people around the world who are also um, running their own servers that are based on the same underlying open source technology. So um, when you're actually 
engaged in annotation itself, there's a couple different ways that um, you as a user or your users, if you're a publisher, could get their hands on the client. They would get access to the client. And the one that we're going to be really uh, focused on today is the idea of uh, you as a publisher embedding that client in your website or publishing platform so that uh, the users come to your publication and the client is already there activated waiting for them to start to use it. They may not have an account and an identity yet, but they would at least um, be able to read any um, public annotations that were exposed uh, and they wouldn't need to uh, take any technical steps in order to access the client and start using it. There's a couple of other ways though that that client can be um, uh, sort of delivered to users these days. And the, uh, the other one that um, most people are using widely now is, is in the browser plugin mode. So that's the case where the user equips themselves with a client in their browser. And so they might use the Chrome plugin uh, which is the most uh, mature version of the browser plugins right now. And so that would mean that any website or web page that they visit with their Chrome browser, when they have the hypothesis plugin enabled, they would have the annotation capability built in. If they happen to visit a publisher's web page who also has the client embedded, Hypothesis handles that uh, kind of seamlessly behind, behind the works and, and understands that there's already a client embedded and delivers that instead of the, the user's browser plugin. And then finally, there's a way to share links um, from Hypothesis. So if you are annotating in Hypothesis, make annotations, and then want to share a link, possibly with people who don't yet have um, uh, haven't enabled themselves with the browser plugin, or maybe you're annotating on a page that doesn't have the embedded uh, embedded client, you can share a link that will uh, redirect every user to uh, a version of that page that has the client injected into it and delivered so that they can start annotating without pre-equipping pre themselves as well. Uh, we are focused today on the idea of how easy it is to actually embed the client in your website, so we'll focus on that. And so at this point, I'm going to hand the reins back over to Heather, and she's going to talk to you about some of the integration options. Great. Thanks, Nate. Um, so first, we'll talk about um, integrating uh, the free version of Hypothesis. As Nate mentioned, um, we're open source, uh, so you can embed um, Hypothesis in your site or your platform. Uh, you don't even have to tell us. We, we like it if you do, because we'd love to make an announcement and we'd even love to offer you free training um, for folks and, and, and resource um, access and the like. Um, the basic implementation um, is very straightforward. It includes all the primary um, annotation capabilities um, uh, that uh, are, are listed. You can, you can create all those different types of annotations that, that Nate mentioned, um, create deep links, groups, uh, and all the like. Go ahead, Nate. Sorry. Nate's driving the slides for me today. Not very well. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Um, it's really straightforward. I am not a technical person, um, but I have been told by a number of people uh, that it is. Um, it's basically a line of JavaScript that you can put on your site. Um, if you also have um, a lot of uh, information in PDFs, there's some additional uh, things you can do to wrap those PDFs uh, in Hypothesis. Um, I've been told by some folks uh, with some excitement that it took them about 30 minutes to install. And then I've mentioned that number to other people and they started laughing and said that they did it in three. So um, I'd love if someone uh, wants to actually screen cast, screen capture um, implementing Hypothesis and we'd love to, to kind of share out to prove how easy that is. Um, we also have um, a number of plugins uh, for embedding hypothesis. Um, before we started working with publishers um, a little while back, um, most of our activity was in the researcher and education space. So um, the Canvas uh, uh, integration is really important um, to a lot of our users. We're recently launching a, pi a pilot with Canvas, um, and we've got a number of schools um, that are using within the learning management system, uh, hypothesis for collaboration assignments, for close readings, um, and that's been pretty exciting to watch that develop. We also integrate um, quite readily with a lot of the other open source platforms out there like uh, OGS, for example. Um, if you have a, a blog or some sort of social activity on your site um, where you have uh, WordPress, for example, um, it's really easy to install the plugin there. And because we want Hypothesis to be available to publishers regardless of their size or, or native technical capability, we wanted to um, 
ensure that if you're hosted, you can easily get hypotheses as well. So we spent a lot of time last year getting agreements in place and doing a lot of explorations with the technical folks. So we're happy to say we've got um, great coverage um, with even a few more platform hosts uh, launching soon. Um, and there's a link that will be available in um, the slides uh, to show you more uh, ways to integrate hypotheses. Um, there's a number of configurations you can do to customize um, hypothesis to fit your site. This is just an example. Uh, don't let your eyes glaze over um, at, for how to turn highlights on and off by default. Um, and we're including a list to all the configuration uh, options as well uh, as part of the documentation. Um, as Nate mentioned, our goal is really to have um, a universal client. Um, that can be used um, anywhere on the web on any type of content uh, for any type of annotation, regardless of um, your intention, uh, to be able to interact with um, and, and share uh, notes that are made um, on content. Um, uh, Nate mentioned the different um, annotation layers, um, so we wanted to show you just a little bit of a, of a screen grab of how a publisher um, may want to display. Whoops, can we go back? display multiple annotation layers. Um, our first two layer publisher is going to be launching in a bit. That's with um, Johns Hopkins University Press. And they wanted, for example, a general discussion layer that anyone could join, but also a layer that's restricted to notes um, from the author and uh, interaction in that layer with um, invited critiquers. Um, you could also have a layer for review summaries or even open peer review. You could have as many layers um, as you like, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, every user and every group gets what we refer to as an annotation dashboard or an activity page. Um, you can use it to see what other annotations have been made. Um, you can explore things that are, have been created by other users. You can filter by tags. Um, you can search uh, by a number of um, different facets. And uh, also, if you take off all your filters, you have access to all the annotations that have been made publicly across Hypothesis, and, and you can search those as well. Um, this is a quick uh, screenshot of, of my activity page. Um, these activity pages can be set um, narrowly or broadly. You might have one per book or one per journal title. You could put in a collection of uh, journals with a similar subject area, or you could have them be, um, you know, domain-wide. And um, it's also important to us that uh, our users who get uh, Hypothesis accounts should be able to annotate anywhere on the web. Um, in addition to HTML, PDF, and EPUB, you can also um, annotate a variety of data that can be displayed in the browser. Um, and one of the things to note, if you are a publisher that has your content um, in multiple locations, like for example, on your own platform, but also in PubMed Central, uh, public annotations that are made on your platform would typically be visible in the public PubMed Central version as well to other folks who, who are bringing the plug in there. Um, similarly, if you work with aggregators, um, as many of you do, um, we're talking with ProQuest and EBSCO and the like to make sure that, and Ovid, to make sure that um, annotations can be made visible um, on their sites uh, as well. There's a number of different ways we can do this equivalent between the documents, and we're happy to tell you more about that. Um, some of them are, are, are listed here on the screen. Um, we have a very robust hypothesis API, um, and you can do quite a number of things with it. You can use it, of course, to read and, and search for annotations. It can be used to create, update, and delete. But interestingly, um, you know, we have a lot of requests for folks who might want to use it for text and data mining purposes, um, and also to repurpose on other parts of their website. For example, you could have interesting annotations um, display in a widget uh, on your marketing page. You could have uh, annotations that are public feed into your Twitter stream. There's a number of things um, you know, that you can do there. Um, and again, there'll be a list to the full documentation. We, we feel really strongly that um, data should be in the hands of the folks who, uh, the publishers and the folks who create it. So being able to export your annotations, being able to make your annotations portable, um, that's really important to us. Now, for some publishers, um, the free version of Hypothesis annotating in the public layer may not be enough, and we recognize that. Um, a lot of publishers view annotations that might be visible by default on top of their content um, as part of their content. And so uh, we do offer um, supported and customized implementation. Um, I see, well, we've got some questions and I'll, we'll just get to those I think at the end is probably uh, best. 
Um, so if you don't have the, um, a technical team or you really don't want to be bothered to implement yourself, um, we're happy to assist you with that. Um, we have simple document-based pricing that offers a volume discount uh, for the more documents that you deploy across. Um, we use number of documents you publish per year as a proxy for size. Um, you can start um, with a small amount of content and expand over time. We also have some journal-based pricing that's available for you. Um, we can connect up if you have your own accounts on your platform so that there's no need for your users to uh, create separate Hypothesis accounts or log in twice. Um, that's something we're, we're happy to tell you more about. Um, and we offer the creation of the publisher branded and moderated groups um, that, that Nate mentioned. There are a number of customizations you can do to your UI to make it look like the annotation client fits um, readily with your page. Um, and we do offer um, a, a really robust program to ensure that you have a successful rollout of annotations, including training, in-house training, training for folks like editorial board members, um, and even training for end users. Um, and we'll work with you to help uh, promote the fact that annotation capability is available on your site. We provide full customer support and also open source maintenance. Um, just a little bit um, more to tell you on publisher groups. Um, these are completely configurable. Um, so the publisher gets to decide who can read the, innovate, the annotations and who can create them. Um, so you can, for example, have groups that are publicly readable, but can only have annotations created by um, a limited number of folks who the publisher has designated. Um, we're launching soon with American Diabetes Association, for example, who wants to use Hypothesis to do um, updates on their annual standards of care um, issue. Um, so, of course, they only want to make sure that qualified folks are, are annotating on top of that um, important medical content. So we're working with them on that group. Uh, the Johns Hopkins um, example that I mentioned earlier can be limited, um, you know, just to authors. Um, but we also offer the capability of groups that are publicly visible and anyone can join, either through your account or through um, Hypothesis accounts. Um, it's completely uh, flexible that way. You can deploy over just a certain type of article, over just you know one issue, as I mentioned, over just one title. Um, and moderation um, is available uh, via folks that you've designated in-house. And there are a number of um, default visibility options. You can, for example, have a button that shows that annotation is, is, is possible on the platform or a call to action like annotate me, uh, different things like that. Um, I mentioned UI customization. Um, there's a number of things uh, that you can do now. Um, you can change the colors, um, you can alter the borders, the typefaces um, are configurable. Um, you can control the width of the sidebar. Exactly. It's not uh, obscuring you know, important content on your, on your site. Um, you can uh, direct whether highlights are on or off um, by default. And um, we can employ some pop-ups if you like for the first time that users uh, visit when you have annotation that give them a little call to, uh, call to action. I'm gonna hand it back over to Nate to talk a little bit about more about what we offer. So um, when we work closely with uh, a publisher who's implementing hypothesis on this paid uh, supported version, one of the first things that we want to make sure is that um, the publisher and, and hypothesis have a clear idea of what's actually going to constitute success for the publisher. What are they trying to accomplish with annotation? There may be cases like the American Diabetes Association that Heather just mentioned, where they're primarily looking to add additional published information on top of a published work. Um, and so the annotation experience for their readers is largely gonna be a reading experience, right? They're not, they're not primarily looking for their readers to annotate, they're looking for their readers to find ancillary information, um, addenda and so forth to the, to the published text. On the complete other end of the spectrum, right, there's the idea of engaging your readers um, in a deeper conversation using annotation uh, as a way to um, bring them uh, more value to uh, visiting the, the document of record, the publication of record. And so um, one of the things that we like to do at the, at the beginning is work with the publisher to kind of define what it is that they're looking to accomplish through annotation, um, you know, to provide more engagement, publish more material, uh, provide an outlet for their uh, authors and editors to communicate. Um, there may be pre-publication workflows that are enabled, different kinds of things like that. And so um, 
by establishing that early on, we can uh, work together to figure out measurements so that we can then uh, evaluate whether annotation is actually delivering on the goals that the publisher might have. And then as other mentioned, follow that up with the idea of training. So there may be um, internal folks on the editorial team that need to be highly trained so that they can annotate. Um, there may be um, groups of authors or um, invited experts that, that might have training. So there might be something like a hosted webinar between the publisher where we are invited to um, provide additional guidance to uh, some of their uh, star annotators, if you will. Um, and another thing that we like to do then is, is help the publishers think about the best way to organize events and, and uh, sort of evangelizing activities so that they can foster additional um, additional annotation on their site. And so there's a whole variety of different kinds of ways that that can happen. And we, uh, one of the things that we do is help the publisher think through and orchestrate the best way to get their community involved in the annotation process. Um, we also uh, are uh, very interested in the idea of promoting the publisher's innovations uh, and also promoting the idea that uh, interoperable standards-based annotation is starting to become a key part of the scholarly tool chain. And so um, we work closely with publishers to coordinate promotion uh, around the, um, their use of annotation on their platform. Um, so Heather mentioned uh, the uh, kind of combination of uh, user-based support and open source maintenance that that hypothesis uh, enacts. And so when we're working with a, uh, a partner who's um, uh, contributing to the ongoing sustainability of hypothesis, um, we are providing that full uh, uh, end user, uh, both tier one and tier two um, technical support. And so we have a help desk functionality um, that can answer any question from, you know, I lost my password and I can't log in all the way up to the um, deeper technical integration questions. Um, and then the open source maintenance is, is a concept that people may not be familiar with, right? But because we're not a commercial entity, um, Hypothesis spends uh, most of its resources, frankly, on developing and stewarding the open source technologies that make all of this possible. And so one of the um, uh, sort of purposes of the um, uh, of the partnership is to have uh, entities like publishers like yourselves that are making use of this open standards based interoperable interoperable annotation um, and making contributions to its ongoing welfare and 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 maintenance and so um, part of what uh, the fees that we collect from publishers that we work with in this way uh, go to is this idea of open source maintenance. And so not only the development and stewardship of the code base and the reference implementation, often um, we're also hosting the server for, for publishers, although uh, with uh, larger, larger customers, sometimes they wanna run their own implementation and we are also uh, involved with that, whether we're hosting it or just advising them on their host, hosting. Um, and then there's also the work that we do um, in the various communities that are sort of surround the ecosystem of annotation. And so that's the standards-based work that continues it on W3C. In fact, Heather was just giving a webinar yesterday um, with uh, Rob Sanderson from the John Paul Getty Trust, who was one of the key architects of the W3 web standards. And there's still work to be done there. <laughs> there's, uh, there's other um, kind of components of the standards that need to be advanced and we're involved in that as well. Um, and then, uh, Heather mentioned the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition, um, which is uh, a, a group that uh, primarily made up of publishers and platforms and people engaged in, in scholarship and research tools that are organized around uh, the idea of advancing annotation, not just hypothesis, but all the forms of, of annotation that might be taking place in the world. And then I can't help but make a plug here for the I Annotate conference. We just um, locked in the dates for next year. So I Annotate 2018 will be in San Francisco on the 6th and 7th of June in 2018. So um, we'll be opening up um, both the registration and the call for presentations to that uh, in the not too distant future, but you might wanna hold the date now. Um, so the 6th and 7th of June, 2018 uh, in San Francisco, uh, will be the next Ionotate conference. And that's a really unique uh, 
gathering of about 150 folks who come together who are just really primarily focused on annotation and it's the activities that that happen around annotation in not only the fields of publishing and scholarly publishing but also journalism and fact checking education teaching and learning and um and research and scholarship more generally so it's it's a very vibrant interesting and yet still intimate uh uh, uh experience that i i highly recommend um, so we've come to the end of our uh, we've come to the end of our prepared remarks um, here, and we're right on the nose at 8:30 um, Pacific time. It may be different for you, and so I'm going to um, actually uh, take down the slides, and we can start um, addressing questions. So we have one queued up that we'll get to um, from Stephen, and then uh, anybody else who's interested in. Um, asking questions, um, please, uh, you can put them either in the chat or uh, in the question and answer tool and we'll be happy to address them. Last time we, we uh, talked with folks for over half an hour about different scenarios um, for, for publication use cases and it was a really vibrant and interesting um, discussion. So uh, Heather, um, maybe you have an answer to this one. I don't know off the top of my head, I'd have to try it. But Stephen has asked if you can uh, annotate Google Books. Yeah, I've not actually uh, annotated Google Books. Um, my, uh, you know, some of the questions that and, and that come into my mind, uh, the work we did with um, uh, New York University Press and Libraries was the to enable the capability of annotating on EPUBs, and part of that process was uh, to be able to inject hypothesis into a frame. So I do know on the Google Book pages, um, a lot of times the 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 uh, pages that you can uh, preview um, are in a frame. Um, and so I'm not sure if that uh, work that we did for EPUB um, implementation, you know, has, has carried over there yet. So it's something that I will um, take back to the team. Um, one of the challenges when you're talking about uh, uh, PDFs like that, some of the older PDFs may be uh, images rather than actually text that's selectable. So uh, for image-based PDFs, um, if you can view them in your browser, you can make a page level annotation, for example, um, if you're not able to, to go ahead and select a text. And we're working um, you know, with some projects to uh, refine that um, so that that will be possible. But I, uh, we will um, we'll go and check it out and, um, and, and get back to you. Uh, if, if there's not um, the capability out of the box uh, to implement uh, annotation on Google Books, um, we can go to our open source community page. There's a number of folks who've, been, who've, um, who've uh, created additional extensions and the like, and it's quite likely someone has a, a, a workaround that enables you to do that. Yeah, I was just actually quickly trying it um, behind the scenes while Heather was talking. And uh, the first, um, the first uh, book that I came up uh, with was actually one of those cases where it was an image-based PDF scan. And so, um, you know, we don't have uh, image-based annotation built into the, into the experience yet. And so um, until there's OCR text uh, to annotate, uh, that, would, that would block that kind of um, that kind of annotation. Um, have to try and experiment with another book that uh, had accessible text that was uh, indeed uh, not just an image. Um, so uh, another question um, from Brian. Uh, how is publishers work changing as a function of annotation? Are they approaching content creation or updating in a new way? This is probably another good one for Heather to address. Yeah, so in many cases, um, if there are critical additions, um, annotations by the author or by other invited experts may well be judged as uh, part of the content. Um, so we've actually just this week been talking to publishers about what the best way might be to depict, you know, official annotations made as part of the book, um, even if they don't want to have a, an entirely separate um, layer for that. Um, so that's one uh, part of the discussion. Um, another uh, really interesting thing that's made possible by the technology behind hypothesis linking is the ability for you to use um, linked data or entity extraction. Um, so for example, 125 journals in the neuroscience space use these things called RRIDs, uh, research resource um, identifiers. And um, those are really critical for 
reproducibility purposes, if you need to know exactly which stem cell line was used or where a reagent was purchased, um, these RRIDs are typed into the papers and they resolve to external databases. A team at University of California, San Diego created an account called Cybot that actually looks for these RRIDs when you open up a HTML or PDF of paper and then displays the information from the external database along the side um, in the form of annotation cards. So you don't need to navigate away to find out the information that lives behind that. So we're talking to a number of other folks who have different types of identifiers like celestial data um, in, their, um, in their content that they'd love to put more uh, information. Um, I've also talked to publishers who are interested in using annotation to give pointers uh, to readers on how to best use their platform. Um, you know, so it doesn't have to necessarily be publishers changing uh, how they view their content. It could be how publishers changing how they view the entire user experience as a result that they now have a, another communication tool. Um, that's possible uh, to use with readers. Uh, we've also got a number of publishers who are using, who are thinking about using annotation in peer review um, and, and with a movement towards different types of open peer review. Um, this is a really interesting example. Uh, eJournal Press has integrated Hypothesis into their manuscript submission um, platform and I think it's available now uh, to all publishers who use eJournal Press and we're in conversations with all the other um, uh, big uh, uh, producers so we can figure out what the best way would be to, you know, to integrate with them. So really, really interesting uh, developments there on the, on the publisher side. And another question um, from uh, Eric, uh, who uh, saw, noticed that there was a, a moderation um, capability and he was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about how the moderation capability works. Do you want to take that one too? Sure. So um, I should say, yeah, you mentioned the student um, example and yeah, students and, and some academics are even notorious uh, for, uh, for having conversations gonna get off, off track or trolling each other. Um, the way that Hypothesis has been um, you know, made available largely through you know, researchers uh, bringing it themselves um, you know, to the site, we haven't seen a lot of abuse um, to date, a handful of cases. Um, most of the examples where students are involved, these are private groups um, that are uh, joinable by the students. Um, the instructor, whoever has created the group, um, can uh, provide a moderator function. There are flags in the private groups, just as there are um, in, in, in the public layer. That you can indicate if you find an annotation to be objectionable. Um, we at Hypothesis do monitor um, those complaints on the public layer and investigate and take care of them. Um, for the publisher groups, as I mentioned, um, there are similar uh, flags that can go to a dashboard that the moderator can use to decide whether an annotation needs to be hidden mm -hmm. or even some more serious um, you know, action taken against um, a person who's done abuse. Um, we're also working on some other types of moderation that folks are interested in. Um, there are some uh, publishers who would like to see every single annotation before it posts. So that's something we'll be developing or to require, for example, um, that anyone have an ORCID uh, before they can uh, create annotations. And as the service scales, we're also looking at things like sentiment analysis and user behavior so we could, uh, you know, pre-screen or, or get some early warning um, systems in place um, if, if someone is uh, undertaking some abusive behavior. Great. And um, <clears throat> I also see that Andrew has asked if um, readers can annotate on their phones. Um, and so I'll, I'll take a stab at that. And uh, Heather, you can chime in too if you want. So we definitely um, optimized for um, browse, you know, larger device browser-based annotation at this point. Um, and uh, so um, the, the best experience you can have is definitely in a, in a full-blown computer. Um, annotation on tablets is, is definitely possible. And some of it really comes down to the amount of screen space that's available. And tablets obviously, obviously having more screen space are, are better equipped to, to handle that. Um, I have annotated on my iPhone. Um, it's, it's not an entirely seamless experience to be sure. Um, and so one of the things that we have on our, uh, on our horizon here, and I, I can't give an exact time frame, but is to um, better optimize the mobile experience because clearly that's, uh, that's important to a lot of different use cases. Mm -hmm. um, so right now I would say it's possible, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. And so if, um, if mobile access and mobile annotation is one of your primary 
uh, focuses, um, you might want to think about an implementation that, that held off until there was further development there. Yeah, and I would just add that I do um, annotate on my phone and it's really a kind of um, user preference. Um, you know, some of us don't like to answer emails on our phone because it's cumbersome to type them out and there's other types of things that we don't like to do on our phone. It also depends on your phone. Um, I, I'm not a, one of the folks who has a, a giant phone. I, what I typically do um, with Hypothesis on my phone is I use it to um, make just a few annotations and then later on I go uh, and a tag and then I go back to my activity page later on to review the article. So I use it a little bit more along the lines of a bookmarking capability, but um, you know, it, it's pretty straightforward. And again, it depends on your, your tolerance for screens. And the other thing there is that, of course, you, um, if we go back to the slide where I was mentioning the different ways that one can get to the client itself, um, if you visit a, a website or platform that has the client embedded, then of course your phone would be capable of delivering it as well. Um, or if you use one of the links uh, to a site that doesn't have the client embedded, but the link uh, injects the client into the experience, then that could also work on the phone. But there isn't a plug-in for your phone-based browsers that allows you to carry it with you wherever you go on your phone. So that's another, another aspect to the phone experience. Um, and then, uh, great, Andrew, uh, let us know if there was some other aspect that you wanted, uh, wanted us to answer. And so Jen has asked, um, Heather, she says that you mentioned the tagging. And so she's wondering if you can tag users in a group. You know, um, Jen, it might be interesting if you could also provide a little more context for, for what kind of purpose you would see that uh, serving. But I'll let Heather uh, answer. Yeah, if, if you're talking about kind of the equivalent of an at mention in an annotation, you can't do that at this time. But what you can do um, on, from the group dashboard um, page uh, that I mentioned before is you can see um, all the members in a group and um, what they've annotated and, and, and you can um, you know, issue a reply to them. Um, different types of notifications are some of the frequently asked questions. Um, and you know, in addition to notifications around replies and the like, we're developing a whole suite of different notifications and um, you know, uh, a tagging a user, an at mention of a user is frequently requested. Again, um, you know, because it's an open source uh, community effort, um, it may be likely if, if that's an essential for you that you, um, you can take a look at um, our developer and community uh, Slack channels, for example, and, and someone may have um, created an extension or a custom edition that uh, will do that at this time. And just while Heather was talking there, I, I shared my screen and brought up a view of, of my user dashboard. And so this is the context where I'm looking at my user dashboard while I'm logged in as myself. So you can see here that I am logged into Hypothesis as myself. And so what that means is I'm looking at this uh, dashboard with it filtered to look at only annotations that I have authored, which is what this little faceted search box means up here in, in the upper left. If I pulled that out, then I would be looking at every annotation that I had access to view, which would include all the public annotations and any annotations that I had made or made privately or made in, in private groups that I belong to. Um, so uh, one can use this uh, dashboard functionality to, to sort of filter um, by user, by tag, uh, which again would be annotations that are, that are tagged with, with certain um, tags yeah. uh, by URL or by, or by group. I see um, Jen's put a little bit more information. Um, so uh, Nate, if you wanna go back to your profile page um, to the right side, there's the tag cloud um, that was visible. So that shows um, all the tags that Nate has added um, as he's been reading articles and he can add those to his filter um, at the top. Um, and you can uh, filter by tags that may have been um, used. Right now, um, you know, when you're creating an annotation and you know, we'll, I think our next webinar will probably be a little bit um, more from a researcher standpoint. And um, we have a video on our website uh, in five minutes where I show how researchers uh, create annotations and make tags. Um, so that may be something you wanna take a look at on the publisher, uh, publisher page. Um, we get a lot of questions about uh, whether um, you can uh, assign a predefined um, tag set. Uh, the 
peer review implementation that I mentioned that eJournal Press did, they did want to have certain tags that reviewers could select. Um, so there is a capability to connect hypothesis up to existing ontologies. Um, if someone wants to do an experience um, around our experiment around that, we'd be happy to, to work with you to kind of pull that together. Um, so either either one is possible. Um, and it just provides um, you know, a little bit more information if you're, if, you, if you're a heavy annotator like I am, um, I think I'm upwards of 26,000 annotations at this point. Um, I can tag them by the different industry groups that I participate in, the, the sessions I'm presenting in or moderating. Um, so I can share them with my panelists and uh, select, you know, just a, just a tag to filter things here. Um, Nate, Nate's showing a project that we do together with um, uh, AAAS called Science in the Classrooms. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that, Nate? Well, when you were bringing up the idea of um, of kind of uh, predefined tag tags, I was thinking of this implementation at AAAS, the Science in the Classroom, where they've done um, something. Uh, this is a really specific and interesting implementation of annotation. I think um, what they their purpose at Science in the Classroom, if you don't know it already, is to help um, people who are just entering the scientific field, whether they're students or other folks. Um, learn how to read real scientific papers and they realize that it's it's reading scientific papers is not an easy task certainly as a humanities person not something that I'm very adept at and so what they've done is you see this learning lens um, box on the left here is they have what is basically a, a predefined set of tag categories that you can um, sort of uh, turn on in the interface in, in different layers. Yeah. And so you can see that I had turned on the glass, glossary tab yeah. um, tag. Yeah. And so what that did was highlighted with a different color um, individual um, terms that have been highlighted and uh, glossed using annotation. So this is basically a way that they can kind of flip on and off different tagged annotations on the same work. And so they've done a lot of work to kind of customize the user interface of how the annotations display to the end user on their site. But the process that they use to um, kind of collect and submit the annotations, if I'm not mistaken, is actually done by grad students who use the normal hypothesis client and a controlled tag vocabulary in order to kind of make these annotations to begin with. Is that right, Heather? Yes, that's correct. And then um, we've, we've got a new question from our old buddy, Steel Wagstaff. Hey, Steel, thanks for coming. Um, and he says that he knows that we're talking about hypothesis for publishers, but he um, has a question about hypothesis for readers and reader apps. And so he's um, wondering if uh, in his use of Pocket, which is an app that he uses to save and read a lot of HTML-based articles, it would it be possible to integrate hypothesis with a reader application rather than a publisher application? Uh, that's a great question, uh, Steele. Do you, I have some thoughts on it. Heather, do you want to say anything about that? Um, so I'm working, you know, mostly in the publisher and, and education uh, spaces. When you're a startup, one of the tricky things is you, you can't run in a million different directions and do everything. That's part of why we depend on the community. Um, so I'd say first, uh, you know, check the community channel and see um, if someone may have been working on this already. Um, we are uh, all in favor of doing um, integrations when that's possible. I'm not familiar with Pocket to know whether that's a open source or um, whether they're working with the standard. Um, now that we do have the standard, um, you know, as, as Nate mentioned, the fact that um, annotations should be able to talk to each other, um, regardless of, um, you know, what uh, service or app, you know, has been used to create them is, uh, is key. So um, that's something we, you know, love to look into um, when we have a little bit uh, more bandwidth. Yeah, actually, I think, um, Steele, there's, there's been a conversation between folks at Hypothesis and specifically the folks at Pocket, which obviously isn't the only application that one might, uh, might use in this way. Um, but it's also one that I make use of. And so uh, I welcome your question for that reason. And so there's kind of been, I think, some preliminary conversation about, you know, what it would look like and if that were, that were something that should and could happen. Um, and it's certainly, I think, technically, certainly within the realm of, of technical feasibility, um, it's really just about um, making sure that, uh, you know, that client experience is embedded in Pocket. And then there's the secondary question of user identity. 
um, now that uh, Hypothesis is using a, the industry standard OAuth authentication protocol, um, that opens the door to integration with other kinds of um, kind of identity systems like the one that Pocket is using, right? Because you certainly wouldn't want to have the experience where you uh, logged into Pocket and then in order to annotate, had to log into Hypothesis as secondary um, as a secondary step. And so I think that really the ideal integration in that case would be one that took advantage of this new state that Hypothesis is in, where it could use, uh, kind of integrate the um, user identity and authentication with, with a tool like Pocket. And then the other question I think goes to the fact that I think Pocket is often used in a mobile environment, at least that's how I mostly use it. And so um, uh, I think that some mobile optimization would really need to happen in order for Hypothesis to be effective in that environment. But I think it's, it's definitely an area that we would like to advance. Um, and as Heather mentioned when she was talking about the universal client, part of Hypothesis's mission is to um, try to make interoperable standards based annotation available everywhere if possible and uh, and definitely part of that strategy is to work toward having annotation embedded in common tools that people use like web browsers um, so uh, you know we have discussions going with some of the major browsers about um, bringing annotation into the browser experience as sort of a fundamental capability the same way that search is right now in the browser experience. So I can't predict whether, you know, uh, an implementation like Pocket or an environment like Kindle or something might be the first kind of thing that we see or whether, you know, it might not be in, in a browser environment um, as, a, as a kind of standard capability rather than as a plugin. We know how Amazon supports open and how they love to share. Um, so maybe we can make a prediction that it might not be Kindle, um, at least at the that. Um, yeah, we keep referring to, you know, these different um, conversations and I've mentioned a couple of times, you know, the community, um, you know, one of the fantastic things about being uh, an open source project is um, that it's not just us um, that are, are thinking about this and working on this. It is a community effort. Um, Nate's pulling up the annotating all knowledge page. Um, just a few more words on that. It's, it's free to join. Uh, if you're interested, it's just for folks who want to explore annotation and you know, we sort of say uh, if, you, if you do annotation, it should be standards based and hopefully interoperable so that it um, benefits the community. Um, if you are interested in, in joining another at Hypothesis and I'd be happy to provide um, more information uh, about that. We do uh, get together um, sometimes for phone meetings and sometimes in person. Um, most recently, uh, prior to the force meeting in October um, back in Berlin, um, which was a really interesting uh, day together with the folks um, at COCO and a lot of other open source projects. Um, one more thing I just want to mention, this is a, um, you know, a, a, a web webinar that's focused on how, you know, if you want to integrate yourself, you know, it's straightforward. So, you know, we didn't include, you know, slides specifically on use cases, but I'd love to hear from you. You can ex do a lot of experiments if you're thinking about annotation. You can use the free version of Hypothesis to try a lot of things out. Um, I've heard from publishers who put together a team within their production department and they included their offshore vendors and they're annotating on top of their XML workflow, answering each other questions if it's in the browser you can annotate it. Um, so we thought that was uh, pretty cool. Um, another one of our publishers is doing a big um, journal migration within their platform host. So they knew that a number of their journal landing pages would need to change as a result. So they created a private group and they made notes on the landing pages about what they thought they might need to update. Um, and, and they said they found that um, you know, to be really, to really helpful. Um, we also have a group that's uh, doing a project between editorial and sales. Uh, so uh, many of you may have uh, sales colleagues who do campus visits and you may have folks on that campus who are authors and editorial board members and in important influencers. And so what they're doing is, you know, tagging um, authors by campus so that sales colleagues can go in and you know, filter and see who they might want to uh, visit or at least uh, drop a name to. Um, and, and so those are, you know, you know, some of the things that you can try out. It's basically a workflow solution. Um, I've heard from some folks who annotate um, purchase orders um, and invoices rather than keep in emailing them endlessly back and forth to each other. So we'd love to hear ideas that you have about how Hypothesis might fit into your workflow um, so that we can uh, find out more about how that goes. Yeah, we seem to have um, 
run out of questions. Certainly people, you're free to leave at any time, of course. Um, we're not holding you here, but we're happy to stick around and continue any conversation that anybody might wanna have. I'm putting some of the links from um, the webinar into, uh, into the chat there. Um, and one of the other things that I wanna share is um, a link to uh, the kind of homepage for this webinar itself, which is where the, um, we will post the recording and um, also has a series of links in it that are, are helpful. And that will be a, a good link uh, to share uh, with colleagues or other folks who you wanna introduce, uh, introduce to the conversation that we had here today. Anybody got other questions they wanted to bring up? Happy to hear from anyone about anything. Does anyone else um, already have Hypothesis integrated into their platform or is thinking now about uh, doing that? In a in a near time frame. We seem to have uh, beleaguered everybody into into hey, si Anne, silence. Valentine has raised her hand. Anne, would you like to type in the chat um, or in the question and answer box? Maybe you accidentally raised your hand. I know the the hand raising functionality is um, maybe not the most useful. Uh, it's like a few years back that was all the rage uh, to do some presentations in Second Life. I know Nature had a virtual island in Second Life called Second Nature. Um, and the librarians were keen on having presentations happen there and your avatars could do all kinds of crazy stuff that you weren't intending. Um, make a fool of yourself in a, in a virtual world. Um, we do have a comment um, from Steele that they're using it with press books at um, University of uh, Wisconsin at Madison. Pretty cool. Nate, do you want to say anything about the, some of the integrations for the OER resources that you're involved in? Yeah, well, actually, we should have Steele step up to talk about that. Um, Steele has done some really great work there at, at Madison on um, integrating annotation into um, open source textbooks and, and other kinds of curricular materials um, uh, using uh, Pressbooks, which is a WordPress based uh, we'll call it content management system that's particularly well uh, suited for publishing um, book length and book book organized information um, and is often used in the OER community. Um, one, I think one of the most interesting things uh, that I've seen with, with <clears throat> uh, annotation in, in the OER space is actually the work that SEAL's done. Um, and so uh, he is, uh, has been uh, sort of experimenting with the use of annotation as a way to deliver additional ancillary information. So in a way, it's a little bit like the science in the classroom example that we were showing before, but in this, uh, instead, it's the, a case of being able to deliver more interactive capabilities that are linked to granular pl places inside a, a larger curricular piece, uh, like a textbook. And so you might have something like a, a formative or summative exercise, uh, you know, an assessment, a kind of quiz, a mini quiz that is linked directly into the, um, the part of the text that addresses that information. So a student can immediately start to practice or get feedback on their understanding of what they've been reading. And so Steele's been experimenting with, uh, with uh, ways of using the hypothesis annotation layer to deliver um, new kinds of information and interaction in that annotation layer that aren't just, you know, human notes <laughs> on the material. It's really interesting stuff. I'll put a link uh, to, um, oh, Seal's already done it for me. He's put a link to his own his own blog post, which is an, an excellent read. Really, really interesting. And so Anne has uh, has now um, got her question up in the Q and A. If you see it there, Heather. I do. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't have the question box open, um, Anne notes that they're interested in adding hypothesis to their app, um, where they have a database of college curriculum in the U.S. and it's maintained in, currently in academic catalogs. Can hypothesis um, be a first step to machine learning. Um, so I mentioned the, you know, the ent entity extraction and, you know, linked data aspect around the research resource IDs. So one of my questions would be, you know, around identifiers that might be used. I know from another uh, startup in a previous life that um, naming of, of courses and, and naming of departments even doesn't have a lot of um, consistency um, across uh, 
across colleges, um, maybe even within colleges. I know my husband works on trying to translate requirements from one department to another, and that can be challenging. So I'd want to learn a little bit more um, about what you've been finding in, in terms of the data. Um, but because hypothesis um, uh, linking technology can point a user uh, not just to a URL, but to creating a persistent, um, unique identifier for a sentence or a paragraph or a cell in a file, um, you know, that, that could be something where you could point people directly into the resources. Um, the hypothesis ABI, uh, API may be, um, as I mentioned, for, you know, text and data mining purposes, something that you could run through and, and, and do uh, extractions on, but we probably need to find out a little bit more about your project uh, before we could um, advise you further. And I think um, I would, uh, Anne, I have been able to do an introduction uh, with our education director, um, Jeremy, so I hope you're able to conduct, uh, connect with him, and um, I'm happy to talk to you further as well. Yeah, and so, um, I mean, one of the basic th things that I just hold in my mind is that, you know, if information is available through a browser and it is in a format of uh, HTML, um, you know, uh, textual PDF, we'll say, <laughs> or EPUB now, um, thanks to the collaboration with NYU and Redium um, and Evident Point and others, um, that there is the possibility to integrate it with, with open uh, annotation. Um, so uh, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of room for experiment there, and a lot of it would depend on the, the kind of nuances of whatever your application is, how it's organized and how it's presenting information. Yeah. So I see we're coming up on the end of the hour. Thanks to those of you who, um, who stuck it out. Um, we will, uh, as Nate mentioned, send you um, a recording so you can share internally. Um, look for um, additional webinars. We've got some coming up with some uh, publishing partners and platform po partners we're working with um, and launching with. Um, so that if you have folks who, who did miss um, today, uh, and they want to attend a live webinar, there'll be plenty of occasion for them to do that. Um, and I can't stress more, you know, uh, we enjoy um, having you interact with us this way. We'd love to hear from you and um, don't hesitate to reach out and get in touch.